So we're going to pick up and maybe actually finish chapter 7 this week, which I'm sure may be a relief to everybody for us to get through finally of chapter 7. We'll be in chapter 7 just about the whole summer. But remember last week we really looked at an emphasis around Paul thinking about the return of Jesus. And in looking at that, we noted that the birth of Christ signaled the beginning of the end times. Paul, the writer to the Hebrews or whoever that writer was, uh, said in chapter 1 that God at various times and in diverse manners had spoken to us in times past but has in these last days <clears throat> spoken to us through his son. So the coming of Jesus, really the, the, the celebration of the birth of Jesus is basically the celebration of the beginning of the end times. And John, in 1 John, talks about the presence of many antichrists and in that day, which would have been before 100 AD, and him saying, by this we know that it is the last time. So when Paul is talking, beginning in verse 29, what I mean, brothers, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have a wife would act as if they had none. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it was not theirs, and so forth. And basically what Paul is, is reflecting is the words of Jesus that in the last days there would be, the world is basically going to get turned upside down in all of society as the end time events take place. And as these things move forward, Paul wasn't just trying to give a time frame, but falling right in line that because we don't know when Jesus is returning. And that's why his return is ever imminent because we simply don't know never been stated in scripture when he was going to come back. But I was thinking about something uh, along this line this week that may have impressed even further upon Paul because Paul really, as somebody at the end of class last week said, it seems that Paul almost was kind of discouraging marriage. And I said, well, yeah, he kind of was. You know, we have to admit that. Uh, he said it's, you know, if you want to marry, go ahead, but if not, you know, that's okay too. And he said, my preference is that you wouldn't. So he, you know, we can't get around the fact that his application of the understanding of the end times in the present crisis, which was the deception that was going on in Corinth, uh, his take was, you need to stay where you are, get as dedicated as you can to the Lord, don't try to get entangled with the world. And as he says in verse 35, I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way, in your natural version, in undivided devotion to the Lord. And what he is saying basically, getting married, having a family, divides your focus. And that's natural, it's supposed to, but in light of all that was going on, Paul was saying, really, we need to, you know, well, the present crisis just kind of back off on that. But in thinking about that this week, remember what Jesus said to the Sadducees in Matthew 22, verse 29 30. Remember, they were asking him about marriage because they didn't believe in the resurrection. And they gave him a scenario that there was this man who uh, got married, and he died, and his wife, according to the custom and the society that day, married his brother. He died, and he said, one or two, all seven brothers ended up marrying this woman, they all died, and they said, finally, she died. And I remember one teacher saying, he said it was about time, you know. Uh, but uh, they asked Jesus, well, whose husband will she have in the resurrection? And Jesus gave a very insightful but brief statement. He said, in the resurrection, those who have a part in the resurrection, which will be us, are not given in marriage. They don't marry. They're like the angels of heaven. So the, the system of heaven is totally going to be different for those who are a part of the resurrection. 
when we arise, whether by a rapture or by the resurrection of our bodies, whichever case it may be, what we enter into is a state that is going to be so radically different from what we experience now. And as I was thinking about that, I remember what Paul had to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. You remember Paul in that section is relating an experience that he had. Where 14 years ago, he was caught up. He said there was a man. And it would say it was exactly him, but that's who he's referring to. There was a man who was caught up to the third heaven. And he said he saw and heard things that were simply inexpressible. He couldn't put it into words what he saw and what he heard. And he said some of it was actually forbidden him. He was not per permitted to reveal all that he saw. So I'm thinking, okay, why was he so focused on not getting any tangle. He got a glimpse of the end. He got a glimpse of what it's going to be in the presence of God. And that glimpse, he didn't, he didn't I, we don't know what he saw because it's not revealed. But what he saw was so bright and so powerful that to him anything that might divide his devotion to Christ to him seemed to be secondary. Let's just drop it. And, and I'm, I'm wondering if that might be actually, can't prove it, but I'm wondering if that might not be a part of why he so emphasized what he did in this section of, of, of Corinthians about marriage, although he said, I'm not restricting you. He said, I'm not trying to stop you from doing it. But maybe he was having in mind the picture he had seen and how radically different everything was going to be. And I was thinking about it also this week that even in, in Revelation, we're told that, there will, that in the new heaven and new earth, there will be no more sea. And I've always thought that that pretty well meant that the sea would not be the danger that it is now. That's what I've always thought. But I'm wondering, because Peter talks about that in the final stages of life, of this world, the heavens are going to be just consumed and everything's going to be made new. Maybe we won't need a sea. Maybe we won't be water base in our biological nature. You won't be spirit based. Spirit based. So if that is so, and once again, this you know we're we're speculating here to a degree, although there's scripture foundation for what we're saying. If that is so, no wonder, and Paul had a glimpse of that. No wonder Paul is saying to the <laughs> If I trip over that, that'd be something for video, won't it? Um, no wonder he was saying, the time is short. Don't let anything entangle. Now, he's not forbidding contact. Because he talked about contact in chapter 5. That we are to have contact. And he said, well, you'd have to leave the world if you didn't have contact with anybody, with any sinner. And he said, I'm not saying that. But what he is saying, let's don't get entangled. Because that entanglement, I have seen the end. And it is so great and wonderful for all of us that if you could have got a glimpse of what I've seen, Paul is saying, you would see that there's nothing that I want to complicate or divide my attention to Jesus Christ. Once again, he's not talking about wrong here. Because he says later on, all the way through the remaining this part of this chapter, he said, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. 
But this may be why he was saying the better choice, because he actually had gotten a glimpse. Perhaps if we all were able to kind of get a glimpse sometimes of what's out there, some of the things we face down here might just really kind of fall away. We all say it, you know. Eye has not seen, ears not heard. What's you know? God has prepared for them that love Him, and we believe that. But we, if we'd ever got a real glimpse of that, maybe some of the things that affect us so out of this life really wouldn't affect us. Talk about a stress reliever. I mean, you know. That's kind of like the second key of the first key, which is the second key. Yeah, I love, I love that commercial where you know the, where the lady in the first kid she got it bundled up, she got all this kind of stuff, and then the second kid she goes she's in a garage, she just hands it over to the to the to the you know mechanic who's greasy and everything. Here, take the kid for a minute. You know, I, I that's that's so true. You know, uh, but yeah, if we could kind of get a glimpse by faith, we can. Paul actually got to see it, and. I'm, I'm just, you know, I just wonder, you know, I can't, can't guarantee it. Well, I think, I think God allowed Paul to see a glimpse of heaven. Not only for our benefit, so we could tell us a little bit about it, but also for his. Paul suffered immensely yeah. in, his, in his ministry. Yeah. I mean, the number of times he beat his shit mm -hmm. so forth and so on. And I think it was for his benefit to build him up so yeah. he could go on. Yeah. Because even when Paul came to Corinth the first time in Acts, he said he was afraid. The Lord had sent an angel to him and said, it's okay, Paul. <clears throat> so you would think, you know, if Paul got shook up, you know, then no wonder we get shook up at times. You know, Paul, that's one way just kind of helps me feel a little bit better knowing that Paul got shook up sometimes. But yeah. Uh, and out of that, Paul received his thorn in the flesh out of the revelation so that he wouldn't just become conceited or vain or arrogant or proud. The Lord gave him something to remind him to stay humble, which maybe the best we can figure on that is that he had some kind of, it's a disease where your eyelashes grow inward instead of outward. And they scratch the eye and so forth. So his, he had oftentimes running sores from his eyes. Uh, Paul was not a charismatic man. He was ugly to look at. He was a short Jew to begin with. And then this disease, he was repulsive. So when he ministered, it was not out of his charisma that we that so many people try to depend on today. But it was the power of the Holy Spirit through him, which was which what he said to the Corinthians, when I came to you, I didn't come with the wisdom of men's words. I came in the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. So I'm just kind of wondering if, if this particular section, which you know, actually does look like he's discouraged in marriage, and yeah, he's saying if you don't have to, don't. But if you have to, go ahead. He's not sinning. You know, they should get married, verse 36. He said, but the man who has settled the matter in his own mind, who is under no compulsion, but has control over his own will, and who has made up his mind not to marry the virgin, the person he is betrothed to, the engaged person, the man, this man also does the right thing. So then, he who marries the virgin does right, but he who does not marry her does even better. That's where that little sense of, is he discouraging it? Yeah, but he's not saying it's wrong. And this could be part of why he, he had that emphasis and that, that confidence to be able to say that. But I, I've seen what the difference is going to be. I've got a glimpse of that. So all that we hold so essential to our life here, he said, really, it's not that essential. The only real essential is dedication to Jesus. Questions, comments on this? <clears throat> so, Paul wraps up his discussion on the marriage questions posed to him by again stating, verse 39 to 40, 40, a woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives. 
But if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. He, he, he throws this back in. He's already dealt with marriage situation, and if you're married and get saved, and you're you're married to someone who is not saved, he said, you know, y'all, if y'all are good with it, stay in that relationship. You don't have to break it up. But if something does happen, as a Christian man or Christian woman, and you become free to marry again, you want to marry in the Lord. If you're a believer, don't make yourself entangled the second time. And he'll touch on this again in 2 Corinthians, but he just deposits this right here. Paul has already addressed those saved within a marriage. Now he's stating don't become entangled again with the loss in a marriage. And he wraps this up by saying, in my judgment, she is happier if she stays as she is. And I think that I too have the Spirit of God. Paul is acknowledging that he's speaking by inspiration. <clears throat> and if we would look at chapter 7 as believers all through our married lives, it might make our marriages a little bit better all around for all of us. Questions, comments as we as we've wrapped up chapter 7. It doesn't get any simple as we move into chapter 8. It's different, but not necessarily simple for us. We enter another section of this wonderful letter. And this section goes from chapter 8, verse 1, through chapter 11, verse 1. And it really can be summed up in Paul's words in chapter 10, verse 31 and 32. This seems to be a, a, a summary section verses. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God. I think that summarizes all that we're going to be looking at as Paul goes through this section. And each chapter kind of builds on each other as we go through this. Now, once again, Paul is responding to questions posed to him by the church. And it seems that the theme that kind of runs through these three chapters is, and Paul's going to touch on it, he's not going to end it with, at chapter 11, verse 1. He's going to touch on it again several other ways. But this is the bulk of it right here. Uh, as one commentator kind of notes, Paul is addressing the issue of how far can I go and still be okay? And we have to remember, you know, we've stated this several times, but it's good to kind of keep it in our minds that this little church was surrounded by pagan life and all that was involved with that pagan life. And coming out of that life, the new believers were struggling to find a balance and spiritual common sense as they grew in grace and knowledge. And probably one of the things that we as Christian believers need as much as anything is good Christian common sense. Uh, most all of the problems that we've encountered in churches would never have been encountered in business or in other areas because people would have used their minds, they would have had a lot better sense, but for some reason when people come to the church they take common sense and set it out in the parking lot with their car or truck and then they walk in. And that's when we enter into some of the ridiculous discussions and situations that churches have. You know, like I've, I've re related to you several times before, but a gentleman I, uh, I knew in, in South Carolina, he was uh, a, a trained hunter. You know, he did guided hunts and stuff like this and got mad because of how they were arguing over the changing of the carpet in the fellowship hall and went to shoot the preacher. Had him in his crosshairs and his scope and pulled the trigger and it clicked. He said his gun never misfires. That was the gun he carried on his hunts. He said it never misfires. And the Holy Spirit kind of slapped him upside the head with that and said, maybe you're not supposed to do this. And, you know, he realized just how much in error. But really, you're going to shoot somebody over the color of the carpet? Please. 
I just want to talk about when I talk about common sense. We, we kind of get our minds set on, you know, this is what I think about it, and bless God, that's the only thing you can think about. And we would never take that approach in other areas of our life. We would use a little more common sense. So I, I think, you know, common sense is one of those things that we really need because as the Corinthians were struggling with, okay, where's the line? I am a believer. Here is the world. I've got to interact. I can't, you know, become a hermit and live up in the hill somewhere. I've got to interact. Where's the line? And how far can I go before I get so involved if I can stay a little help? I fall into sin. Where's the line? How do I manage to exist in this society that is so pagan and still live faithfully for Jesus Christ? So, you know, this section speaks to us as 21st century believers because we wrestle with the very same thing. Where's the line? What, what, what is, what is, the, what is the, the place that I, I stop at so that as I live and carry out my business, my affairs, my interactions with others, I am... As chapter 10, 31, 32 says, I am glorifying God in it all. Which goes back, if you will, to chapter 4. What are you building on the foundation of faith? What's your Christian life looking like? Because that what you're going to answer to. Your sins have been forgiven. But how much wood, hay, and stubble are we building as we try to see, can I get this close and it's okay? Or do I have to stay back over here and that's okay? So that's what Paul is going to be looking at some in this, this section of Corinthians. And I've entitled this section, Christian Freedom and Responsibility. And uh, it's, it's an interesting discussion. So as we move into chapter 8, uh, New International Version, I'm going to go ahead and read the whole chapter, short chapter. Now about food, sacrificed items. We know that we all possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know. But the man who loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world. And that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone knows this. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they can eat such food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to an idol. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat, no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you have this knowledge, eating in an idol's temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to idols? 
So this weak brother for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against your brothers in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause him to fall. Now, <clears throat> this short chapter serves as an introduction to the issue of drawing the line in living between being faithful and crossing over into sinning against the Lord. And this chapter can be divided into three basic sections. Uh, verses 1 through 3 is one, verses 4 through 6, and then verses 7 through 13. <clears throat> and if we look at it in that sense, it kind of helps the chapter uh, be a little bit more understandable to us. Now, Paul announces his movement into this new section of discussion with the phrase now about food sacrifice idols. Now, the International Version has food, King James Version has things, some other translations have meat in that phrase. And each one of those translations reflects the, the general nature of the term, the Greek term, and really reflects on the larger discussion that Paul is going to have in chapter 10. Meat is primarily what was offered to idols in that day, but at the same time, oftentimes other foods were also offered to idols in the temple. So when you have um, the New International Version translation of food, that's probably, and even the King James things, I think it captures a little more broadly rather than just focusing on the idea of, of meat. And these different translations are just trying to capture the interpretation of that. Now, a question comes up is, you know, why would Paul bring all of this up? Now, in the ancient idol worship of that time, what was brought to the altar was generally divided into thirds. One third was consumed on the altar. One third was kept, was given to the person who brought the offering. Then another third was given to the priest of that temple to have as their share. There was part of their livelihood. Whatever it was offered was divided in this way. And oftentimes so much, especially being in the city, so much was brought to the temple that the, the priest had more goods than they could consume and it would go bad. So instead of that, they would simply ship it down to the marketplace and sell it. They would get the profits off of it but, you know, it was sold in the marketplace so that the food wouldn't go bad. Others could share in it, but it was still food that was uh, originally offered to the idols. And this is where it became a problem to the uh, Corinthian believers. Should they eat? This is, this is a bowl full of things that has been sacrificed, you know, I mean, has been offered to idols in sacrifice, so should I partake of it or not? And if I should, under what circumstances, under what conditions can I partake of this and it not be a sin? So they were they were really struggling to try to figure out how do I how do I handle this line? How, how do I Go between those two. So that's why they posed these questions to Paul. They needed some leadership on this. So what are some of the ways? Now we've already talked a little bit about this about carpet in the church as an example. But what are some ways that we encounter the same dilemma? What are some ways maybe that you have heard others or maybe you have struggled with yourself at some point in your life? You may have gotten victory over it, you got clear of it, and that's okay. But just as an example, what, do you have some things that, that, that you know have, have come in to challenge you? How do I, how do I manage this line?
watching, perhaps, that see us, and then they associate that those strength. Now, that gives a whole other yeah. problem. But, you know, it's like, and then there's times, well, well, perhaps if we're able to speak and talk to them, they'll see that our viewpoint is maybe okay. So it's kind of yeah. one which yeah. way is the right way without mm-hmm. harming your witness necessarily. I don't know that that would be called seeing it. Right, right. Yeah, and, and, and in that particular instance of what you're sharing, it would be more about witness. Now, if there was a weak Christian sitting in the same restaurant who really thought, I'll be sinning if I drink. Well, she's drinking. She's with people who drink. I guess it's okay. I, I'll go ahead and do it. Even though I know I shouldn't and it's wrong. That's where they have sinned then. You know, you haven't made them sin, but you've caused them to stumble. Because Yeah. Paul, Paul said earlier that I became all things to all people. Okay? And I and as I understand it, that means he did some things that maybe he normally wouldn't do to draw closer to people so that he could have fellowship with them and speak of the gospel. Okay? Paul was not about don't do this, don't do that legalism. He's free from legalism. Christ is free from legalism. Um, alcohol consumption seems to be a hot point, particularly in Baptist uh, denomination, and it's, and it's not a sin to consume alcohol. Drunkenness is a sin. And if you have a weak conscience, as Paul was talking about, to alcohol, you probably should not do it. That does not forbid a man or woman that has a strong conscience constitution that they can't. Yeah, because so and, that's how it relates, yeah. I think, to us yeah. in this day and time. Yeah, yeah and, and I think, you know, along the line, Jesus was accused of being a drunkard. <clears throat> this man fellowships with drunkards, yeah. publicans, and sinners. Yeah. You know, he eats and drinks with them. Now, whether that was by insinuation because he was with them and didn't, he did turn a bunch of bats from water into wine, so, you know. Uh, but once again, yeah, this, this, yeah, we do. These are some things, you know, alcohol is one. We talked about church issues. You know, carpet, paint. We could add music, ministry styles, all that, you know. But, yeah, there you go. Working on Sunday. So if, if he had if it had been a his hardest day of work at all of all to fish, it still would have been sin. Because Sunday is the first day of the week, so you know Saturday is, is the yeah. 
Sunday is the first day of the week, you know. So, you know, if you, if you look in the law, you look at seven days, which is Saturday is the Sabbath. And that's what Paul is bringing out in, in verse 2. We know that we all possess knowledge. That knowledge is explained in verse 4. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and there's only one, there's no other God but one. We all have this knowledge. But the problem comes in is that knowledge puffs up. Well, I can do it. Just watch this, you know. And regardless, because we have freedom, we understand freedom, we don't understand the responsibility that we have to help someone who doesn't have as much spiritual strength. Doesn't mean that they're a bad Christian or a sorry Christian or whatever Christian. It means that they don't have that same level. You can't take your knowledge and then step on that other person's conscience. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Love builds up. Love strengthens. And that's, that's where the complication came in with the whole issue of how far can I go and where's the line and how do I approach it in Paul's discussion here. Because, you know, the Corinthian church had those people who felt like, you know, I am rich, I am free, I am safe, I can do anything and everything is fine with me. Even having someone in the church that is living in incest is fine. Chapter 5. You know, you said you're proud of that. That was that knowledge that was popping up. Yeah. Children, I mean, they're starting at a very young age seeing everything you do, right? And so the same, same as what Tony's saying, some people are children in Christ. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a great similarity to think about. I know that control a lot of life. And, and, and part justification, justification is a point in time. Mm -hmm. Sanctification is process. Yeah. Yeah. And and part of you know going back to that impact on our children, one of the things that we oftentimes all have done is, and we've had to do it, and we've seen times where we've had to do this too, is to explain why I did thus and so. Because the kids looking at you like what? And we need to teach them. We need to instruct them. We need to help them understand. Uh, one of the things I think for our present generation, and I know every generation talks about the one coming up in the same way, <coughs> but it seems like that there is a total, you know, how convenient can it be for me, whether it's inconvenient for you or not, really is, is irrelevant. How convenient can it be for me? And we have a generation that is growing up with that type of mentality. And when they become adults and enter into the business world where they don't really care whether it's your convenience or not, you know, uh, you're going to do the job or you're going to find some, you know, some of them have a really hard time dealing with that. They need to understand, you know, no, life isn't fair. Life isn't good. We have in our country, and on that little short cruise we did overseas, it, it was pointed out uh, in just how some people lived. And they, were, they, they thought they were doing pretty good. Over here, they would be so far under the poverty line that they'd qualify for everything. To you see... To take that extreme, too, when you look at the church today. It's easier for them to work their job and hire three or four pastors. Mm -hmm. As opposed to having to take on responsibility within that church. Yeah. That's something we struggle with today. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Going to ministries. <laughs> ministries with 
within the church. What should we have? Who should do it? Well, we need to pay somebody because it would take too much time for me to do the studying I need to do to do this job, so I would rather pay somebody else to do it so I won't have to. How close to the line of, is that getting? Near, far? I, I don't know. But once again. Generally, the line, the line doesn't exist. Like you've got drawn. It, it goes back and forth. It's not a hard, fixed line. Okay? And I'll use myself, for example. Anytime that I've entered into sin, and I believe this is true of all true Christians, I would be miserable. The Holy Spirit makes me miserable now. And that's, that's for him trying to call me back to that union, that, that uh, fellowship. fellowship with Christ. Okay? Yeah. But that line does this all throughout your life. Yeah, yeah and, <coughs> and, and exactly. exactly. That's why that's why it is so curvy, because it is so different. You know, uh, what what we may have the freedom in this room as believers and our knowledge and dedication to the Lord to be able to do, other people do not have. Doesn't mean that we're greater and they're lesser. It's, it's not about that. It's about growing in grace and knowledge. And if we have been able and been fortunate enough to grow and become mature enough that we can understand more things, we don't have then the freedom to take our knowledge and either shove it down somebody's throat or step on them with that. That, that's what Paul's having to deal with here. And we always have to remember that Satan's plan with this line is to always keep moving it further and further into the world and sin. Move that line further and further. So that through that desensitization, we can more easily be pulled into those areas as a believer and face complications, have our testimony discredited, have more troubles, things like this with our witness and about serving the Lord. Satan's desire is to keep moving this line deeper and deeper. If he can't, he can't keep us out of heaven because we're saved. What can he do? Let's try to discredit them as much as possible to everybody else. And by moving that line is one way, you know, that he tries to do that. He's doing a very fine job of it. Think about the language. Oh, yeah. You know, and it doesn't have to be cable or mm, no. Just well, homosexuality, men kissing men, women yeah. kissing men. Yeah. The shock factor is not there as it was when mm -hmm. I remember. You know, it's just like commercials and everything, and, and that's the way the devil used those powers too. Yeah. When you repeatedly see this, you know, it's proven history. If you make a person watch this over and over and over, it starts to corrupt their mind, and they start thinking like. Cause, you know, and that was torture back in the, you know, World War II. The Japanese and stuff did that, and other countries did that to do that factor of brainwashing. Yeah, yeah. And it's during a crime time. Right. The show itself might be fun, but then they show this commercial that it's just right. Fun. Yeah. And now I've, I've mentioned about working around people that when I would say something about my relationship with the Lord or my work in the church or something, it, I, I've, I've noticed this over time of how almost invariably I am going to hear some of the foulest language come out of that person. I don't think they even know 
that they're doing it intentionally. I think sin is just that strong that it pushes them out. But because something about relationship with Jesus Christ sparked that reaction, they came out with some of the some of the worst language that I would ever hear in working with them has come out over the several times that even just coming up in conversation, I would try to weave in a little something, bang, you know, it would just, that spark would hit. And I don't want to know that if they're truly aware of it. It's interesting because you're talking about the sacrifices and talking about the purpose, well, whether they should eat meat or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who had the ability to, sac uh, to provide sacrifices at the time? Because what about the people in the they're impoverished? They can have sacrifices. And they, you know, if you had told me the third would be given to the less fortunate, you know what I mean? Then this is a different conversation, you know, when you're talking about social mm -hmm. differences, right? Because we're all pretty much the same. Right? I mean, we all dealt in the world and I think we all have the same income, the kind of same exactly. But when you start getting away from that, you know, to the point, what, I mean, because it's all in fresh, right? So what all, what changes as you're getting to different areas too? Because what, the, if you and I are together here, fishing, whatever, is a sin. But if we were in the inner city, that's not, you know what I mean? It's a different, yeah. so where, Going back to the thirds, those thirds and people that didn't have anything to sacrifice, where were they in this situation Paul talking about? What is their influence and how are they part of this conversation? I was under the assumption that there, the sacrifice may have been on a smaller scale or on a, instead of meat, it would have been bread or grains of some kind. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I didn't think that. Yeah. And it wasn't so much that they were offering, believers were not offering these sacrifices. It was what had, it was the spillover from the excess of sacrifices offered by sinners to the idol and full worship of that pagan god that was extra that was now sold and the poor people would have a chance to maybe buy this. And that's where the believers were wondering, okay, can I can I buy any of this? Can I eat this? Can I? And if so, what are the conditions under which I can do this? So. I think with I think this whole section is going to be a wonderful conversation, and and I appreciate all of the comments this morning. I want us to just keep pumping that up as we go, because Paul is going to really kind of help us understand where how do we how do we find the line to begin with? What do we do to find the line? Because most of the time we don't even know where the line is. I mean, it's not something drawn out there that says okay. Some things, immorality, yeah, you know, but at the same time, where's the line around friendships and associations? You, you know, that's where that's where all of this stuff begins to come in and gets so difficult for us as believers. Yeah. I want to say one thing, because Lord told me this years ago, that the church itself, and it's in reality, has created the mess that we're in. Had we been loving the world the way we were supposed to love the world, we haven't helped we ourselves. We have been doing the things God called us <laughs> yeah. to do. Instead of giving the picture that Christians are no different than anybody else. They just, because so many Christians become lukewarm Christians. They go to church, and then they live like they're in church. Mm -hmm. And then the world sees that and thinks, well, sure, I want to be a Christian too. Yeah. And there's no true change of any type. Yeah. And so, as the church has evolved into that, then the world has become exactly what we have. Because we think about it, we're in a world where we get to choose by who we vote on and things of that nature. But the more selfish we become, the more we go over that line and further. And it's all a picture of all the things you're saying right there, how we've allowed that line to shift. Yeah. Yeah. By not basically being obedient within the new covenant. Yeah. One of my favorite verses out of this whole section of chapter 8 is where Paul says, Yet for us. That's, that's a powerful phrase, yet for us. And we'll talk about that. I'm, they'll be ringing the bell, and the young ones are about to start out there, I think, waiting to get in. So thank you for the conversation. We'll, we'll keep this going next week. Thank you.